a parenting habit can take ordinary moments and open up new pathways of grace where you respond differently to the chaos because there's always going to be chaos. Justin, welcome to Focus on the Family. Thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor. This is so great. Okay, so there was a moment. Uh, this is a wonderful book, Habits of the Household. And uh, John mentioned that scripture, cease striving and know that I am God. Mm. So there was this moment where you hit that face to face. It's a lot easier said than done. <laughs> what was that moment? You know, as soon as I had kids, I realized this is hard and this is chaotic, right? And this is kind of universal. <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, some people get stressed out. Young parents do. It's not always going to be yeah. zero to three in that pace That's and right. diaper change and That's all right. the dirty dishes and everything. But what, what, what I see is in my life, once we aggregated a couple kids in that stage, <laughs> yeah. and you, you have three kids, you know, under five, and I see a lot of parents doing the same thing. They lift their heads up and they say, what has happened? <laughs> what have and, we done? And this, this was my experience. So I'm putting my uh, three boys down for bed one night, and there's you know, bath water on the floor. They're escaping from the bath. They're wrestling naked in their room because I can't catch them. They're still soapy and wet. I mean, and this is normal, right? This is just a... <laughs> I experienced this last night with foster kids. <laughs> there you go. This is funny. This, this is normal is, is the point. I mean, it was just a wild, chaotic night. And I remember I just snapped into my what I call the impotent dictator mode, where I yell a lot, but it doesn't really change anything, oh, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And I finally wrestle them to bed, um, tell them I love them, God does too, and shut the door. And I just sit with the irony of that moment. That mm. you know, I just spent the last 20 minutes sort of yelling and wrestling them. Wow. And then I'm like, God loves you and I do too. And I'm thinking, what do they think love means? And I was really convicted at that, at that evening because I thought this is my normal. My normal is this ongoing, I would even say liturgy of rush and anger that was defining the household. And that was the night that I thought, what if a different liturgy or what if a different set of habits came about? What if I treated this moment of chaos as one where I could lean into loving them and showing them the love of God instead of just yelling and wrestling them to bed? Yeah. And that let, was a pivotal night for me. Let me ask you, Justin, because so many young parents, uh, you know, parents with young children particularly, it's hard to get that moment to have that realization, yes. that rationalization, that spiritual epiphany mm. that, geez, I just shouted at the kids for an hour telling them to do yes. this, and then I told yes. them God loves them. That right there is quite an awakening. I would call it exactly that. Yeah. It was a moment of the Holy Spirit coming in and saying, your normal is not okay, hmm. but I have a new normal for you. And I just think that's really important to name because anybody listening to a conversation like this can feel a lot of guilt. And I just want to reframe that and say there's a, that's a lot of grace. When the Lord comes in and shows you that yesterday doesn't have to be like tomorrow, you can, you can change. That is His grace coming in and saying it can be new again. Yeah, and what's so powerful and what parents need to hear is it, it can be done. You, the Lord will give you the deep breath that Amen. you need to not be so uh, switched on hmm. with anger or something like that. This is just part of it. You just got to take a deep breath. Nothing's going to be perfect, but it can take some thinking and yes. some prayer in that regard. Now, you mentioned the idea of bedtime liturgy. Now, people may not even realize litur liturgy for many people is you put on a robe and you right, strike right, incense right, right. and you're humming. That's not what we're talking about. Exactly. You're talking about a rhythm of life. And this was your pastor that made this suggestion. Yes. What did he tell you? Yeah, so it's, into that moment of grace came a moment of community, which I think is really important to name. I took that failure of that evening, and I went and talked to my pastor. And he suggested I try a bedtime liturgy, which is probably sounding as foreign to everybody else as right. it did to me in that moment. But it was just this idea of a bedtime routine shaped in spiritual practice, you know, prayer and a devotion. And I came back and wrote my first quote-unquote bedtime liturgy. I had this list of questions I was going to ask the boys, and I actually wrote it down on a sticky note. And it was going to be, can you see my eyes? They would say yes. Then I'd say, can you see that I see your eyes? They would say yes. Then I'd say, do you know that I love you? Yes. You know that I love you no matter what bad things you do? Yes. You know that I love you no matter what good things you do? Yes. And then I'd end with, who else loves you like that? They would say, God does. And I'd say, you rest in that love. Really sweet, sentimental little go back and forth. Great plan. It sounds great. Sounds but then you great had to live up to it. Oh my gosh. I could, the first time I did it with him, I couldn't remember what I was supposed to say 
um, they took the eye thing as an invitation to poke me in the eye. You know, can you see my eyes? Yeah, they're right there. <laughs> um, they didn't get the answers right. I said, you know, do you know that I love you no matter what bad things you do? And they thought about it for a second. No. You know, it doesn't seem like that. Oh. So it was a moment oh, yeah. where you, what I realized was, you know, nothing's normal until it is. Particularly in the family, you can make lots of things normal for better or worse. So we persevered. And the, the high point of this story for me was about two weeks later, we had practiced this a couple of times. And then I have a night just like the first one, bath water on the floor. Everybody's misbehaving, including me. But my youngest son got into bed and said, can we have our bedtime blessing now? Wow. And we had this little exchange about the love of God for us, uh, me and them, that he loves us no matter what. Mm-hmm. You know, that message of grace, that he loves us no matter the good things or the bad things, and that we can rest in that love. And I remember closing the door that night and thinking, wow, the circumstances of the evening were all the same, but I was really different. Yeah. Because this habit, this new routine, meant that I was now focusing on this meaningful moment with them instead of on just managing the chaos and getting out of it. And it really, that was the moment where I realized, okay, a, a, a parenting habit can take ordinary moments and open up new pathways of grace where you respond differently to the chaos, because there's always going to be chaos. Justin, uh, how is eating more than just a physical activity for nourishment? Oh, my goodness. It sounds like that's what it's about, is yeah. nourishment. <laughs> you know, the, the modern knee-jerk reaction is that food is either fuel or fashion. It's like you do it because you have to. It's like gasoline. Just put anything in your body. You need energy. Or it's, you know, we're taking Instagram pictures and showing off our life. But one of the things I like to draw Christians' attention to is that food is the one of the way that God shapes us in community and his generosity towards us. Throughout the Bible, food is a place where God meets us and we meet the world. And the table. So, the table, right? Yeah, you come pretty to amazing. the table. Power of the table. So much more is happening at the table than we think. Mm-hmm. And so one of my recommendations to parents is to say, lean into that spiritual reality and meet your family at the table regularly because so much is going to happen between you and your children at the table. So true, especially Coco Krispies. <laughs> you guys don't those. eat those anymore? Uh, it's fun to have kids around. I can't around, believe I, <laughs> They're still hanging out in yeah, the you pantry. You mentioned uh, company for a hey, week, so you've got that, the Coco Krispies. Sometimes I look back and I think, it's amazing, the desserts for breakfast my parents had. <laughs> exactly. Right. That has really changed the comfort <laughs> food. Uh, tell us about your tradition of lighting a candle during dinner. That's well, one, another good one. Yeah, one of the ways we try to lean into this spiritual reality of eating and communing at the table is by marking the moment. So I have four boys, right? And um, I think all kids, but particularly boys, they like fire. So, you know, one of the easy ways to the say... The bigger, the better. The bigger, the better. Something significant is happening right now is that we uh, light a candle in the center of the table and we all just say, Christ is light. Now, we have this nice little routine, yeah, lighting the candle, Christ is light. Here's what it actually looks like. All the boys fighting over who gets to light the candle. And then who and, gets to blow it out. And then who gets to blow <laughs> yeah. it out. And then sometimes burning in the process. And I could talk about all our rhythms of family meals. You know, you, you have to say, please pass this. And you have to compliment instead of saying, I don't like this. We share about our day. We, you know, we eat real food together, not just Cocoa Krispies. But the reality is those are all nice aspirational things. Our dinners are so messy. You know, there's so much fighting. There's so much complaining. And sometimes you would think, is this worth it? Like, here's, here's Justin telling us we should have family dinners, but it looks more like a WWE wrestling match. <laughs> okay, I, I, like, I want to come join you at dinner. Yeah, this yeah, sounds fun. fun. <laughs> the reason I just admit that is because I want to say to parents, honestly, any sort of spiritual habit or routine in your household, with young children particularly, is going to be messy. And the whole point of this conversation is like the first story with bedtimes and bathwater is that the, the grace that God will bring to that moment is to help you be present and spiritually formative, discipling your children amidst the mess. You know, it's such a hard discipline or hard habit in your lexicon to tamp down that initial reaction of yeah. correction of, hmm. wait a minute, it, there's something in us that right. responds with order. Right. Like, uh, wait a minute. Right. And some people have that default switch set quite high. Mm-hmm. You know, don't mess that up. Don't do that. Don't spill that. Don't, you know, you can fill it in. And you learn over time to kind of absorb some of that more fun chaos, you know, where it's yes. okay. It's not going to, yes. it's just going to take a mop and a sponge. Right. So it's not the end of the world. Right. right. And, and I think that's an important distinction there. There's, 
There's just a natural chaos to parenting toddlers. Yeah. There's lots of mops, lots of sponges. Especially lots in of phases. Spills. That's right. Yeah. And when you can be a gracious, non-anxious presence in the middle of that, like one of our routines between my wife and I is, you know, every time there's a spill and there's so many dinners, we just say, that's okay. Help clean it up. And lots of times that's between grit teeth. Yeah, but I it's different tell. than saying, why are you spilling again? Like, yeah. how, What were you thinking? You know, yeah. Reserve your authority for moments where discipline actually needs to take right. place. Where you need to say, okay, you just hit someone. That's not quite a mess. That's where I need to bring my that's loving authority issue. as a presence, yeah. as a parent, and say, there's something wrong here. Yeah. And I think um, when we use up all our corrections and anger on things that don't deserve them, they can't tell the difference. You know, what's the difference between hitting my brother and spilling a milk? Dad is just always mad anyway. Yeah. And I think it's part of your job, I think particularly for fathers to think about this, is to, you know, don't exasperate them. Be gentle yeah. until they need to hear the loving authority of no, you stop, come here. Because then they'll hear it. Then they know the difference. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you need to think about that. Yeah, Justin, one of the difficulties, and Gina and I experience this, and I'm sure most couples, you and Dina, I'm sure John experience this, it's discerning a mountain from a molehill. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, this is constant. And, yes. and in fairness, I think Gene would say, yeah, there's not any mountain that you see. It's all molehills. And I would say, yeah, there's not a molehill in your future. It's all mountains. <laughs> right, right, and so right. even as the parenting, you know, we, we tend to marry people who are different from us. And mm. in the parenting space, it can show up that way that one doesn't see much of a mountain with behavioral issues. The other one sees nothing but mountains. Mm. How do we negotiate that? How do we absorb the spirit, the Lord's wisdom, to discern between the two and when it is a mountain and not a molehill? Oh, that's that's such an important question. My best answer would be the way that the Lord has worked in my life in these moments is by encouraging me in the habit of pausing to pray before mm. I go into a moment of discipline. Mm. That's really good. And I, you know, this is so simple in theory, just you hear them fighting upstairs over the video game controllers. <laughs> On the way up the stairs, say a prayer. You know, and this could be short. Yeah. Or, you know, someone hit someone in the car. This happened just two weeks ago. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to this kid. And then I thought, let me pray first. And what happens, I think, is, you know, prayer moves mountains. Mm. And sometimes it shows you this mountain is a molehill or this molehill is a mountain. And just inviting the Lord into that moment often changes the way that I approach it so significantly. I, I ran up the stairs getting ready to just lay down the law. And then I realized, you know what? I also get mad when people take my stuff. You know, I, I also get frustrated. I'm a little more like them than not. Let me be gracious. Mm. Or I realize I'd really rather ignore this, but I need to lean in here. I need to talk to this kid about what he just did. Mm. I need to have a good conversation with him. I need to realize this is not a molehill. And often that, that wisdom comes in that moment of prayer. And you know, parenting is hard. None of this is going to be easy. So why not pray more? Yeah. You know, why not say, as a routine, a pa as a parent, I'm not going to enter a moment of discipline until I've paused to pray on the way, however short. Just say, Lord, be in this moment with me. And I think the other thing, the Father's patient with us, you know, you aim for that, you hit it once, you hit it twice, ooh, and then you stumble. But get back up and keep aiming for that patience and that example. Yes. You had a friend named Drew, and he kind of changed your understanding of what hospitality means. Yes. What did Drew tell you? Well, Drew, I'm so happy to give him a shout out. He's a, he's a wonderful friend. Um, he recently got married, but for many years in the past five or six years of knowing each other, he was single. And he came to me at one point and he said, you know, I don't have a family here in town. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. Sounds like a dinner invitation is coming. It, yeah. He was like, <laughs> can, I, if I, come to your house can for dinner? I be a part of your family for dinner? I thought, <laughs> sure, that sounds great. You know, invite him into the rhythm. But but the practical reality of that was, you know, our dinners are messy. You know, the WWE wrestling match, like I said, um, we, we don't, we can't clean up every time. And I just, I just was sort of like, that sounds great. I'll, I'll get back with you. A couple months go by, and he's like, hey, I was, I was sort of serious about that. Like, I, I don't have any sort of family rhythm. Can I join you all? Sometimes I said, okay, let's try it. So every Thursday for a stretch of years, we said, Drew, Uncle Drew, just show up for dinner. And that was such a formative time for me because he just started coming into our family mess. And he really taught me that hospitality is not entertainment. Mm. You know, hospitality is opening the messy home to your neighbor, mm -hmm. to the single person, to the stranger, to the hungry person, to the poor. It's just anybody saying, join this economy of love, however messy it will be. Yeah. And I, I, there is actually great 
research out there about one of the things that makes children's faith more sticky is having deep relationships with believers outside of the family. Sometimes this is grandparents, sometimes it's the church members. But we do an incredible thing when we invite the world in. And so one of our stated goals is just to have the extra chair at the dinner table. And Drew really taught us this, to say that anybody can come into the mess and, and join this economy of love. And it's good for us and it's good for them. This is where the family meets the world yeah. in the extra chair. It's so true, but that's pressure too. So your wife, Lauren, I'm assuming before you said, Drew, yeah, let's do Thursday nights, you did talk to we Lauren. We did talk to Lauren. Oh, okay. yeah. she, I didn't and, get that part of the conversation. This is, credit to, this is credit to Lauren and Drew because Lauren said, okay, but it's going to be messy. You yeah, know, she didn't say, yeah. I'm going to take on the pressure to make this pretty. She said, okay, just know it's going to be messy. Speaking of Lauren, she kind of threw, a, I think, a little bit of a shock through the family with the boys with screen time. Yes. Now, this may be the number one parenting issue that we face here at Focus on the Family and probably in the culture is parents just... I think it absolutely You know, is. they're so troubled by screen time. It's so powerful and so alluring and so addicting in some cases that it's hard to fight as a parent. So what did Lauren do that kind of reset the rules? Lauren one day came to me and she said, we're gonna stop doing iPad time every day. <laughs> and I was shocked um, because it was the one hour or maybe hour and a half a day that she had as a break. To get things with done. The kids, right? Yeah. And so I said, I, you know, I'm all for it, but you're the one who has to deal with this. She, I was like, are you serious? And she just said, it's not It's not worth it. It's not helping. They're more spun up afterwards. I feel like they're getting addicted. I feel like this isn't a good routine. And she demonstrated something that has changed my perspective on this. And here it is. You can change your screen time routines. You can. And parents I have par the power. Parents think, oh, no. It, it's out of my hands now. Everybody has an iPhone. Everybody has an iPad. They already, they, they're, they're used to this. I can't take it away. Lauren showed, I think, something incredibly important is that, no, you're the parent. You're in charge of this. And Jim, I do think this is the number one is. issue facing yep. parents and us. I, in fact, I tell people often, probably the most important thing in your discipleship to Jesus right now is how you interact with screens, parents and children, mm. because your ability to pay attention, to love the world, to be formed in, in good content and not false content depends enormously on how you use screens. And actually, incredible and incredibly sad data is now showing up, showing how malformative, how bad mm -hmm. constant screen time is yeah. for adolescents, particularly girls. Yeah. There is an emotional, a mental illness epidemic. And I just want to say gently, but truthfully to parents, wake up. Yeah. It is your job to form your children in how to use screens well. And this, yeah. don't be afraid, you can do this. But take it really seriously, because one of the most important things that you're going to do with your children is hopefully to send them out of the house knowing that community is better than virtual community, <laughs> actual friendships are the real yeah. meat of life, that attention matters, and to have integrity online. Yeah. And that requires a parent. It's like really, we need to rise to the challenge. Really mm -hmm. important. Let's end with this. How can parents live by faith while in the tension of the now and the not yet? Mm. And you got to describe that as well. Yeah. Well... So much about parenting children is, as we have talked about, it's messy, it's hard, it's, it's the difficult, now. it's the now. But one of the things that we need to do is just lift our eyes to the not yet and that what is Jesus going to do through our parenting? Mm -hmm. And one of the tools that I give parents to do that at the very end of the book is an age chart where you write down all your, you know, get ready, this is scary. You write down your ages from now to the next three decades. And then beside those years, you write down your children's ages. And you will have this frightening moment of, oh my gosh, I'm getting old quick, my death is not that far away, and they're leaving the house is not that far away. But this is what I want people to realize, that, that you have a limited but beautiful time that the Lord has called you to steward, and it's called parenting. It's a limited you know, season. Um, and obviously you stay a parent when they're out of the house, but there's a limited time where you get them under your roof. And when you see that on paper, then you can start feeling, okay, these are the years of where I need to be really present, family trips. These are the years of conversations. These are the adolescent years where it's going to get really hard. And I think God uses moments like that. The Proverbs say, without vision, the people perish. Mm. Without a sight, the way forward. And I think looking at what the Lord can do and zooming out is one of the great ways to say, okay, I'm going to be intentional in the now. Mm. And just, you know, lean into that. The Lord wants to use this stage, but sometimes he needs to pull your vision back 
so that you can see the big picture. You know, Justin, this has been such practical advice. And again, we haven't really had anybody, in my opinion, that has talked about this. And I'm so grateful that you've written the book, Habits of the Household. And uh, what a great resource to kind of set those rhythms up mm -hmm. and learn to carve a new rut mm. and to do the things that are opposite of your flesh as a parent. <laughs> I mean, both you and I are often, we're listening to the broadcast going, oh, I wish we would have heard mm, that yeah, when our kids sure. were like three. Sure, yeah. And this is one of those moments. This mm. is a great resource. If you're the grandparent, get it for your adult kids. Yes. Uh, I'm sure they'll appreciate it, especially with the broadcast or the uh, podcast as a help. And uh, yeah, if you're the parent saying, I need a different way because it's not working, it's chaos every night. Uh, get this great resource, Habits of the Household. If you can send a gift of any amount like we normally do, we'll send it as our way of saying thank you. We don't pay, we're not paying shareholders, <laughs> so not like some of those big direct mail people. Uh, but all the proceeds go right back into helping other families and doing ministry together. So make a gift of any amount. If you can do it monthly, that really helps. That's how Gene and I support Focus. And I think uh, that'll be a great resource for your library. Yeah, contact us today for this book, Habits of the Household, Practicing the Story of God in Everyday Family Rhythms. And uh, when you request that book, make uh, a generous donation as you can. Our number is 800, the letter A and the word family, where you'll find all the details to donate and get the book in the program description. Justin, thanks for being with us. This has been great. Thank you so much, Jim and John. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us today for Focus on the Family with Jim Daly. I'm John Fuller inviting you back as we once again help you and your family thrive in Christ.